ordained of the Lord for them to come. So um, we have a title today, and it is Stirring Up the Gifts of the New Testament Evangelist, Part 2. And again, last week was the same title, Part 1, and I laid out a biblical pattern, and I preached what the New Testament talks about as far as an evangelist goes. And that was Robert and Paula Reed, and they brought an impartation. And what I did, as I said, I scrunched down the sermon that I had originally prepared because I wanted them to have plenty of time to talk. And they did, and they were amazing. And so there are some things that I'm going to pick out of what they said from last week, but I want to go deeper in this whole thing because I I just feel like God's not done um, imparting to us in this area and for this time. Um, It's my heart for this church. My heart, Sherry's heart for this church is something that literally Robert said. He said, God, he said, he is choosing this house as an apostolic hub. An apostolic hub. And, and um, that's a big deal right there. That, that, that would be something that really primarily is not even being offered in this, in this valley that I know of or, or in Missoula that I know of. It's just not. It's something you have to be intentional about, something you've got to pray into, and something that you have to spiritually facilitate um, or it won't happen. There's, there's churches out there that will talk about it, but, but to let it happen and to really encourage it is a whole other thing. I started out by talking about Ephesians 411 and I had you hold up your hand and I said apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher and that the, the, the apostle can touch them all and that the apostle and the prophet, these two that we use all the time, the most used fingers on our whole hand represent the apostle and the prophet and it talks about that God does nothing without first talking to the prophet. It talks about he lays the foundation on the apostle and the prophet and then Jesus is the chief cornerstone. They are so critical and so essential, especially in this hour they've always been critical and essential but but so the five-fold ministry it says um, it talks about the five-fold is there to equip the saints and it's the apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher but I wanted to talk about the evangelist and I still want to talk about the evangelist the apostles talked about 28 times and I would just want to first um, with the scripture kind of lay a little bit of a foundation of who we had in the house last week um, by uh, inviting the reeds and so if we look in in luke 9 1 this is uh jesus and and then he jesus called the 12 disciples note that they were only referred to as disciples at that point together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases so who were they At first, they were just referred to as disciples. Then we go to Luke 2. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Notice he didn't say the kingdom of salvation. It's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is all-encompassing. It it has to do with equipping and releasing and power and gifts. It has all sorts of things to do with with the life of Jesus. And then what was interesting is... is, uh, if you notice in verse 2, is he sent them out. So first they were, they were disciples. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God to heal the sick. And then in verse 9, it's not in our slides, but in verse 9 it says, and the apostles when they had returned. They went from disciples to apostles, and the only thing that happened in between is they got sent out. That is one of the definition. That's one of the definitions of it. The, the one thing that changed between when they, when they first were given the authority by Jesus and when they, they returned as apostles was they were sent out. So when we send ourselves out, when we go out and God sends us out, we'll talk about that some more, something changes in us. There's something changes from us sitting in the church and us going out. But, but I want to expand on that a little bit more. <clears throat> it also, okay, that incidentally was all before Pentecost. Jesus gave them authority and gave them the anointing to go out and do these things. After Pentecost, Jesus had arisen and, and was resurrected and seated on, seated on the right hand of the throne of God. And so now let's look at what happens in Acts 13. Acts 13, 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord, these guys were ministering, they were, they were do, we, do we ever think about that in our worship, that we're actually ministering to the Lord, or are you just trying to get something from Him? We, we should be, that picture, as, as uh, Bruce was painting that picture, he was ministering to the Lord. As we worship, our worship is ministering to the Lord. So it says in Acts 13, 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. 
Notice who, who, who said that. And the Holy Spirit said, that's pretty wild. So, so now Jesus is on the right hand of the throne of the Father. Now, now the Holy Spirit's doing this sending, okay? And it says, it says that after, after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit sent them out. There was five of them there, and, and prophets and teachers is what it says. So, well, let me go, actually, I... I didn't have that in there. It would be 13 too. But they were, they were referred to as prophets and teachers at that point. They weren't apostles. And, and they were fasting and praying and they were ministering to the Lord. But then in, in 13 too, it says, Now the Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul, which that's Paul. And, and then in 13.3, something unique happened. Then having fasted and prayed, and laid, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So in the New Testament model, these guys weren't referred to as apostles and prophets, or, or they, 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 they prophesied, but they were referred to as teachers. And once they were sent out, and in verse 13.3, uh, uh, then they fasted and prayed and they sent them out. So it, there's a pattern here. The Holy Spirit sent them out. He's the one that called them. And then the church prayed over them and sent them out. So now we have a New Testament after Pentecost example. And when they came back, they were referred to as apostles. In verse 14, 4, one chapter later, the exact same guys, they went from being teachers and, and guys that could prophesy to apostles. So I'm just making a point. When they get sent out, that's what activates them. There's something about, but in the new, new era of, that we're in after Pentecost, it's two parts. It's the Holy Spirit and it's the church. So, and I'm making a point here that, that there, was, there was no um, freelancers. There was nobody going out and, and self-appointing, oh, I'm an apostle, that doesn't have a church behind them, that's honoring them, that's seeing the giftings in them, that, that, that doesn't have the Holy Spirit sending them out. That's the New Testament model after Pentecost, okay? And so it's just something to keep in mind. The point I'm making in all that is I believe that last week we had two genuine apostles in this house. Two that had been sent out from the church work that they are over, but two that the Holy Spirit had empowered. And, and here's something else. Those guys have been at this for 40 years. That's a long time. 40 years of ministry. Some of you guys got that in your, in your uh, uh, what do they call it? Your your portfolio type deal but uh, those guys came and they were seasoned and they were right on and, and this won't be on the teaching or the, the uh, Facebook live but some of you guys on your testimony said when they would look at you it would just that's what I felt like you know, they was looking at this this window of my soul it was just looking right into it and those words one one of you guys described that there was no ums and ifs and, and buts and mumbling do you know that Robert's 72 years old and he's sharp? He's so sharp. I just want to attribute that to the Holy Spirit. All these years of walking with the Holy Spirit has kept him sharp, sharp, sharp. I'm telling you, that's why I want to be like, that's, that's awesome. And so anyway, I want to review somewhat of last week because they said and they gave us a strategy for this house this house and um, Paula when I met her like I said I saw her up there preaching and I thought the Lord said you're looking at a New Testament evangelist and and she gave us some strategies and uh, I just want to take a, a little bit of time and spend some time talking about that evangelistic strategy um, she said you need to start by simply witnessing our testimony and, and prior to that, you know how I told you I had all these notes that I was building for, for this sermon and I had like 12 pages of notes and I thought, well, Lord, if I have them preach, I won't. And I just prayed into it and I, I felt that I did and I did what I felt I was, should do is, is do the first part, the first 20 minutes or whatever I did on what is a New Testament evangelist. And I had already looked it up that the Bible says our testimony um, 90 times and it talks about testify 30 times so the combined of testimony and, and testifying is 120 times in, in the Bible so it's a big deal that's, that's really what we're called to do is give our testimony Doug the evangelist you know back there we've got uh, Brian the evangelist and all of you guys so don't, don't think that that's just them though this is a call to all of us to give our testimony our testimony is powerful and so when Paula said that Start by giving a simple witness of your testimony of what God has brought you out of or what God did for you. 
Okay, you can't go wrong with that. And everybody can do that. You don't have to think, oh, I don't have that gifting. You know, yes, you do. You have all you need to tell people what God has done for you. And I ran across this in, uh, it's uh, the English Standard Version says then in Psalms 119, 111, it says, your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I tell you what, and I just thought of it this way. Our testimonies bless God's heart. They really do. And actually, then I went back and I read the first chapter and the second one, right, or the verses, and I'm like, oh, that's him talking about God's testimonies. But you know what? I believe it works the the way that I thought it would in the uh, beginning is that our testimonies do bless our Father's heart. When we're talking about what Jesus has done, think about it. If you've got kids and people are talking about about your kid and what your kid did in their life, that's going to bless your heart, isn't it? It. So I believe that our testimonies bless the heart of God. All right? And Paula said that your testimony testifies to Jesus' resurrection power. So when you're talking about what he's done for you, and, and you're talking about, and you're given the name of Jesus, who did it, and we talked about that last week too, that we need to include the name. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which you can be saved. That name is the most powerful name in the whole planet, and we need to include that in our testimony. It's not like, well, God did this or, or whatever. Talk about the name of Jesus, all right? And there's power in your testimony. Power to witness. Revelations 19.10, it's not in our slides. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When we testify what Jesus did in our life, it's like we're prophesying. It's like we're releasing the same power of prophecy. It's powerful, guys. If you hear anything I talk about today, recognize that in this hour especially, we need to just, everywhere we go, just drop a little seed of our testimony, wherever we go. And, and you know what? You're going to leave that person with a deposit. Amen? All right, so the other thing is uh, Revelations 12.11. Now you do, and I'll bet you all have this memorized. Revelations 12.11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their what? Testimony. Testimony. And they did not love their lives even unto death. You know, we could preach on just the last part. It wasn't about them. They weren't making it about them. They loved the Lord more than their own life. They loved, they loved the gospel. Okay, so Jesus and our testimony qualifies us. There's a statement all on its own. Jesus and our testimony qualifies us. That might be a good thing for us to just tell somebody on our right or our left. Say, my testimony of Jesus Christ qualifies me. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's just true. That's just, that's just true. Our testimony of Jesus Christ qualifies us. He's the one that qualifies us. Okay, but this is also true, is our character also qualifies us. And the Lord was speaking to me on character. And um, we must have integrity of character. And I talked about integrity is even a better word. I love integrity. It, it has to do with like going and looking at the hull of a ship to make sure it's seaworthy to go back out and hit the biggest, baddest weather there is. Integrity of, of the hull is like integrity means sound, found. It's just, it's really good. But character, character is something that we need to make sure that we have in our life and our walk with Jesus. Our character validates our testimony of Jesus. And, and the opposite is also true. If we've got, we can have a testimony for Jesus, but if our character isn't there, it literally, instead of qualifying it, it disqualifies it. And, and people know that. People see that in us and others. They're like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, but you're living just like the world. Guess what? Your testimony has been devalued. It's not validated through, through your poor character. And so that's a huge deal, guys. To those who are desperately needing Jesus, they need to see the character following the testimony of what Jesus has done in your life. Amen? So last week, I left off talking about Philip. If we want to know about what the New Testament evangelist looks like, we need to look at Philip. Philip was said in the only place in the whole Bible what evangelist is, and they said Philip. Philip was the New Testament evangelist. And in Acts 8 9, I, uh, I went through Acts and I talked about Philip and, and gave examples. But I want to go back and I want to talk about character a little bit and I want to talk about Simon. In Acts 8 9, um, it talks about Simon the sorcerer who was, a, 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 he astonished people. 
this guy astonished people with the power that he had. And, and Simon was said, they, people were saying, this guy is someone great. If you were to look in Acts 8, 9 in your Bible. Verse 8, 10 says, this man has great power of God. See, that's, that's going to happen a lot more in these last days as well. We're going to see people that are, are masquerading as people that have the power of God. But it was sorcery for Simon. Amen, be careful. And verse 11 said that he astonished them for a very long time. And we do have verse 12. Verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. All right, so he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God. I got to thinking, well, what are some of the things concerning the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's in the Holy Spirit. There's three things, righteousness, peace, and joy. Another thing is Jesus said, but if I cast out, he said in, in uh, Luke eleven twenty, but if I cast out a demon by the finger of God, you know that the kingdom of God has come upon you. So deliverance is a big part of the kingdom of God. And, and, and Jesus, the name of Jesus is what he also preached, and we talked about that already. It's that name, guys. We gotta get the name of Jesus in there. And, and did you hear Paula last week? The blood and the name, the name and the blood, the name and the blood. And oh my gosh, that lady had some anointing on her. And, uh, but men and women were baptized. That was, and we've got this baptism coming up on Father's Day, and I talked to Doug, and we're rounding them up. I said last week, round them up, guys. If you have daughters and grandkids and sons and, and moms and dads and family members and uncles and aunts and neighbors, come on, ask them if they want to get water baptized. And Because it's a, it was a mandate. We're, we're called to get water baptized, and we've min minimized that, but the New Testament evangelists didn't. As a matter of fact, I did the math, okay? I did the math. At, at, on Pentecost Day, 3,000 of them got saved, and they all got water baptized. So you do 3,000, and you figure, well, how long, how's the fastest baptism you can do? Well, at least two minutes. So 3,000 times two minutes is 6,000. That's 100 hours. 100 hours. But let's see, how many guys did they have baptized? Well, let's say they just did the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles. All right, boys, we're baptizing these guys now. Get in the water. So they, they started out, that would have taken eight and a half hours of in the name of and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Bam. <laughs> Bring the next one. Bring the next one. And then I got to thinking, and we're going to talk a little bit about the 70 or the 72 that got sent out. I did the math on them. That'd still be two solid hours of baptizing people uh, at 3,000 with 70 of them doing the baptism. I'm telling you, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. The whole town was talking about that, that thing. Can you imagine if we were like baptizing the town of, of Hamilton, how big of a deal that would be? So, so that's what it looks like when you're in revival. That's, that, just, that just blesses me to think of that. But uh, anyway, it, when it goes on in, in Acts 13. It says, um, let's see, I don't want to get ahead of myself. 12 was talking about how he preached concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, and both men and women were baptized. And then in verse 13, Simon the sorcerer, he believed and was baptized as well. And, and so... Simon heard this. He was in the mix. He was in the crowd. He heard the, he saw the people getting back. And he's like, well, pfft, I want this Jesus. And I don't know. It doesn't give that much detail about Simon, except that he was previously a sorcerer. And he came in. He did get baptized by Philip. And he did, he did receive Jesus. And, and Acts 2.41 talks about, uh, well, that's, that's the 3,000 that got, got water baptized. But there was no mention of Simon getting any um, deliverance at all and, and renouncing. We know that that's part of Philip's ministry. We talked about it last week. I have that, that scripture again this week. But there's no sign of that for Philip. And so let's just say Philip kind of, uh, whatever, he, he, he made it through the cracks. He, he sleeped through the cracks or whatever of getting the full meal deal. Remember last week I talked about being a full service station where you go in and get your car, the oil changed and your tires aired up and they check all your fluids and they wash your windows and they pump your gas. They don't have that anymore, do they? And they, they don't really have full service at the churches anymore either. You come, you hear a sermon, you go home type deal. But, but 
really the full service meal deal of a New Testament evangelist includes deliverance and healing and baptism and, and baptism in the Holy Spirit and, and laying on of hands and, and, and bringing them out of darkness, okay? And so there's a concern that that's not even happening to the degree that it should. I told you guys a long time ago when you met Andrew, the guy that was from Paraguay, and, and ran, Andrew was brought to the Lord in Paraguay and they, they believed in James 5.16. Confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. And then when you'd get saved in Paraguay, they would literally sit you down and say, okay, ask the Lord what, what sins you need to confess and, and you go back in that room and when you come out, we'll pray those things and we'll break those things off. He had so much deliverance the day of his salvation that he came into the kingdom big time. He came in strong. He came in. And I wrote this down. How you come in can make all the difference in the world. How you come in can make all the difference in the world. If you come in, pray a prayer, every eye closed, every head bowed, and you don't get any of the five fivefold ministry, you don't get the ministry of the evangelist, you may be handicapped through the rest of your days. And I didn't even put this in my notes, but I have a whole section about Apgar, maybe I'll talk about it. Apgar is what they count is an Apgar count of a baby at, at one minute and I think five minutes when you're born. One minute is how you did through the birthing process and five minutes is how you're doing outside of the womb. And, and it's an Apgar count and, it, and there's a total of five things that they look at and one of them is your breathing and one of them is your color, one of them is your heartbeat, one of your, you know, all these different things and they can count two points max. Okay, and, and, and a zero is bad. If you come out and you've got a blue baby and this baby's not breathing, you're going to have a bunch of zeros. But the best score you can get is a 10. And there's a joke, only the doctor's babies get a 10 at community hospital because they're the doctor. But I had a daughter named Evan, and when she came out, she wasn't, she wasn't coughing or crying. She came out and she was looking around. She was perfect color. She was looking around and all the n nurses were like, oh, oh my gosh, look at her. Look at her. She, was, she, she should have got a double 10. She, she should have got a double 10. And they gave her a 9 and a, and a, and a 10. They did give her a 10, but I, uh, a 9, 10. But, but I got to tell you, it's kind of like that in a birthing process. How you... Um, come in to the kingdom of God can really matter. Did you come in distressed? Were your, were your parents really in a good place? Did they love you? Did you have two of them? Did you only have one? Did you have, you know, stress and, and all chaos and confusion? Was there, were there complications in the birth? And, and when we bring these, when these people and, and they said, they're coming, they're coming. Those apostles said, they are coming in this house. Get ready, they're coming. Are we ready to handle these people the way they come in to the church? Are, are we ready to minister to them? Do you know, Back in Paraguay, when Andrew, my friend that was here visiting, uh, Sabine preached, but Andrew just visited on another Sunday, they would have them renounce, renounce these things in their life. The church doesn't even teach about renouncing. I teach it. Renouncing in 2 Corinthians 4, 2, it says, they renounce the hidden things of darkness, the things of shame. Renouncing those things. And even recently, we've had a couple salvations, and I'm thinking, Lord, don't let me fall into this, this habit the church has got into of not praying with people right off the bat, just breaking some stuff off right off the bat. Let them get a good, good launch into this, this kingdom experience with Jesus. So we need to be mindful of that stuff. So we have no sign of Philip getting, excuse me, we have no sign of Simon getting these things. Philip ministered to him, but he was ministering to a lot of people, you know. I feel like, I feel like Simon slipped through the cracks, so to speak. All right, because it, wasn't, it was part of Philip's ministry to do these things, but obviously Simon didn't get it. Now, if we look in uh, Acts 14, Peter and John, when they called for Peter and John, um, because these guys had not been filled with the Holy Spirit, they needed recruits. They needed somebody to pray the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Philip was, he had lots of disciples and he needed some help. So Philip and John came and they came with one intention to pray for them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. The number one Physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is speaking with an unknown tongue, a prayer language. Jude 20 says, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. It's for our good. It's the only one of the spiritual gifts that actually helps us to, you know, deal with stress and anxiety and go through situations. And it's a good gift, amen? We need it. If you, at the conclusion of this service, with this, this uh, New Testament anointing um, that we're praying in to stir up the gifts for, if you have not been released in your prayer language, please, please let us pray for you. Please let us encourage you. And if you've hit a wall on that, that's even more reason to 
come up because those walls, the Lord's shown me some, some ways to get through those walls and we'll pray through them, amen? And so Peter and John were there and in, in verse 18, Simon saw them laying hands on people and and he's, he's watching and he's thinking, I want to do that. I, I want to do that. I want to pray for people so that they can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, hey, I'll even pay you money, guys, if you let me have that gift. And oh my goodness, that's when, that's when it wasn't pretty because the boys, the apostles said, oh, you think you can buy the Holy Spirit? You think, oh man, you're, you're way out of line there, Simon. Okay, so we're talking about having good character, aren't we? We're talking about our character validates us. Our, our character um, qualifies us. And evidently there was some bad character in Simon and he didn't, get, he didn't get any deliverance. He didn't get any freedom and healing. He just got water baptized, believed in Jesus. So I believe, I believe honestly that he was saved. I believe that we may see Simon in heaven. And when we do, we've got to ask him, Simon, how, you know what? Did you, did, weren't they doing some deliverance around there? Couldn't you just come and say, hey, guys, I need a little freedom here or something like that. So be sure and ask Simon when you see him in heaven. Otherwise, in verse 21, it says, this is what they said to Simon. In Acts 8, 21, you have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. You can come into the kingdom. You can receive Jesus Christ and still not have your heart right with God. Okay, it's real, it's real common, especially in these, this day where, where it's all this love, 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 and there's no real emphasis on repentance. There's no emphasis on, 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 you know, confessing your sins one to another, praying for one another that you might be healed. And then in verse 22 and 23, it says, repent. That's what they told him to do. Repent. Uh, though uh, the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So it's so wild because it was the thought of his heart that was the problem. He had, he had bad motives. He had bad, bad uh, uh, intentions of this receiving this Holy Spirit. And we can have those coming into the kingdom of God as well. It says, and he says, pray for me. He says, pray for me, guys. So there was a sign of repentance in him. And, and he said, pray for me. And, and uh, they said that your heart is poisoned with bitterness and bound with iniquity. That's, that's what was going on in this guy's heart, and yet he still came to Jesus. So we need to get the stuff out of our hearts that aren't right. We need to get that stuff. So the point I want to make at this point is everybody, remember Fabara? You guys would remember Fabara Obama that used to be come to this church, and he was at uh, Shiloh. By, he used to say, everybody has got something they need to get rid of, but this is how he would say it. Everybody got something they need to get rid of. And, and it's true. We all got stuff. We, we're talking about the buttons, weren't we? Um, I, we got those things in our life. It's a constant thing. Lord, search me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me. Did I break the microphone? It sounds like it's louder now. Anyway, uh, but uh, here's Acts 8.24, 8, and it says, Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. So that sounds like he had some repentance there and I got to thinking, boy, well, that sounds a lot like Deuteronomy 28 where it talks about 43 curses that may come upon you. Things come upon us because of our sin, disobedience, and us not backing up and saying, Father, forgive me. I renounce those things in Jesus' name. Renouncing is something very powerful, very necessary, and very important in our lives. A curse, incidentally, is not a demon. A curse is something that a demon rides in on. Demonic stuff rides in on a curse. And I just got to say, do you know who probably the number one person that's been cursing you is? yourself exactly we speak stuff over ourselves all the time we need to work on each other parents and family and and husbands and wives when we hear ourselves saying that kills me or i'm dumb i'm stupid i'm whatever stop them right there and say i i don't i don't receive that if somebody says it about you and say that ain't right that's a lie from hell you know stop it in its tracks do not curse yourselves because there's power in that stuff and some people will say oh curses are in the old testament that's all over with jesus said i I did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it those curses are still they're still real they can still happen and and so don't underestimate those things okay so are those things could come upon you just like he was concerned about all right so i'm going to move on 
But knowing the consequences of sin leads people to repentance. That's something that's very important. If we don't preach about the consequences of sin, we, uh, we won't necessarily see people come to repentance. Why should they repent of anything they're not concerned or think that's, that's an issue? And Luke 3.30 uh, 13 3 Jesus said unless you repent you shall all likewise perish I looked up perish guess what perish is perish is eternal well one of definition is eternal misery in hell um, I'm going to talk a little bit about hell today because nobody ever seems to talk about hell anymore but it but uh, Jesus um, had 70 verses. I, I kind of had a controversy there whether it was like 46 or 70, but Jesus mentioned hell at least 46 times, and I believe it 70 times. Hell is real, guys. Hell is real. As much as I don't like it, as much as you don't like it, as much as we don't like to talk about it, hell is real. And here's something else. It's eternal and it's everlasting. And, and if you look in the Bible, there's over 162 times it's talked about in the New Testament alone. So if we think that we can just go la, 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 and it's not real, it's as real as we're all standing here and sitting here. So I got to just say, hell is something that is being minimized in churches at, a, at a, a, a rate that's never been seen before. It's something that we need to recognize. And if you ever go to a church or you have kids that go to a church that, that wants to minimize hell, my best advice is run. Run. Because what that will do is it will limit your ability to have a fear of the Lord. It will limit your ability to take this, this saving soul seriously. It will limit your ability to walk you know, right with good character. It's like all these things go wrong if you take that out of the equation. So we need to keep hell in the equation. The um, last, um, at, at, there's at least three false teachings out there right now on hell. One is nihilism, which is, is kind of a, a no hell uh, philosophy. The other one is Christian universalism. And it's basically that everybody, everybody goes to heaven, all roads lead to heaven, and everybody will eventually come to their understanding, oh, I blew it, oh, okay, I'll go, I'll, I'll choose Jesus now. That's not in the Bible. You will not find that in the Bible. There's even a church in Missoula right now that is getting, uh, you know, it's going into Christian universalism. All roads lead to heaven. Nobody ever goes to hell. That's a lie, guys, it's a lie. And then there's another one called soul sleep. I, it's also called Christian um, mortalism. Seventh-day Adventists believe in it. Jehovah Witnesses believe in it. The Latter-day Saints, the Mormons believe in it. It's a lie, guys. And guess who's the father of lies? Satan. He wants everybody to believe that there, we don't have to. We ah, oh, don't believe in hell. There's no such thing as hell type deal. That's a lie from hell. Amen? Yeah. Amen. All right. So all biblical New Testament evangelists believed in hell. All of them. They, there wasn't one of these guys. They went to the cross. They died. They were martyred. They were martyred for believing this. They believed that if they didn't preach the gospel, people would knowingly and unknowingly go to hell. All right, so anyway, <clears throat> last week, and now I'm going to shift back to Paula. Paula, she's the evangelist, and she said, you have got to talk about sin. I know it's not fun, but we have to. If we don't talk about sin, guys, there will be no conviction to sin. There's no reason to even want to or need a Savior if you don't talk about sin. Without sin and its consequences, these are quotes, she said, without sin and its consequences, you don't need a Savior. Okay? Um, understanding the, the penalty of sin that Jesus paid for that and the consequences is what people, it helps them come to the revelation of why he even went to the cross. It seems senseless if they don't understand that they've all, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, she talked about the name of Jesus. We have got to include that name. That name is the name by which we must be saved. That name has power in that name. She talked about the blood. The blood of Jesus is what cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We have got to talk about the blood, the shed blood, and the cross. The cross is is, those three things are essentially the gospel and the gospel is the power of God unto salvation we're wondering why people aren't getting saved and it's not sticking they're not preaching the full gospel the simple gospel of that has the power of the salvation in it of the gospel okay so she said and she said she said don't get particular 
Don't you get particular, you evangelist, when you go out. And she says, she talked about the dirties and the stinkies. And she said, of all the ones, when she'd go back after she led people to the Lord, the dirties and the stinkies are the ones that it stuck on. And she said, ask the Lord for the one. Ask him for the one. And you know, you might see the, the pretty, the, you know, the sweet lady that's so easy to talk to. And Oh, well, I'd rather talk to her. But there's this, uh, the stinky and, the, and the, the dirty and the stinky right next to him. And you ask the Lord, Lord, which is the one? What's the one? And he might say, go over there. Because they might be to the point where they are so sick and tired of being sick and tired that they're like, I just need Jesus. I just need piss. Because a lot of people feel like, I don't really need him. My life is fine, okay? But that, that dirty, stinky part, person may say say i am so sick of this life i want i want out or i want jesus and they're ready so don't be particular and then we do have this on slide she specifically talked about isaiah 58 6 and she referred to fasting and it said this is not is this not the fast that i have chosen to choose to loose the bonds of the wickedness to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke guys everything about that verse is talking about deliverance everything about that's talking about the oppression of hell everything about that is talking about setting the captive free and and the key to that is fasting we got to be a fasting church i'm the first one that's got to get on the bandwagon but we got to get a, a routine of fasting especially when we go out god's sending us out guys we got to start fasting and praying up and she said that will take that, that's what changes everything on the real hard cases and when you go into the spiritual warfare and the realms of, of spiritual opposition, the fasting will make all the difference in the world. Okay, so after that, <clears throat> last week in Acts 8, 7, it says that, that uh, Philip, when he ministered, un unclean spirits cried out with a loud voice and came out of many. Guys, that's New Testament Christianity. That's New Testament. And we don't see that, do we? We don't see any of that stuff going on. I think it's because we're not preaching the cross, the blood, the power of the cross, and we're not talking about sin with people. And you know what? You start talking, the blood, the devil does not want to hear about the blood. I remember R.D. Schombach years ago, I was listening to a, a teaching, and R.D. Schombach had somebody manifest, and, and he was preaching, and, and uh, some people took him, took him uh, uh, this person that was manifesting with demonic stuff, he was preaching the blood and the cross and all that stuff. They started manifesting, they took him out in the back, and he got done preaching, he was all sweaty, and he went back there, and they were still pray, praying over this person. And he says, Lord, what do we need to do to get this person clean? set free and and the lord spoke to him he, he got a couple of the big black girls off the choir and said i want you to pray start singing about the blood and this this like not the blood not not the blood not the blood and the thing just blew right off him the devil hates hearing about the blood so you start talking to people out there and about the blood and the power and the cross and sin don't be surprised if the same thing doesn't happen these unclean spirits are going to start coming out they're going to start rising up and we'll teach you in this house how to minister to them we will teach you how to have a working understanding how to minister freedom and healing through deliverance it's we need it we need it and and for such a time as this do you know that about a third of jesus's ministry approximately was doing the ministry of deliverance it's not it's not some kind of a keep it in the back room thing it was always out in the open it was always out in the light and here's what it says in first john chapter 3 8 this is jesus's ministry he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil you know what that's basically saying jesus appeared even but was manifest that was one of the main reasons jesus came on the scene is to teach us to disciple us and to empower us to overcome the power of the enemy and if we want to put that in the back room or if we want to exclude that from our ministry we're missing something that jesus has commissioned us to do all right and you know mark 16:15 he says go go preach the gospel to every creature mark 16 16 says and he who believes and is baptized will be saved and he who does not believe will be condemned and mark 16 17 and these signs shall follow we could preach a whole sermon on these signs shall follow those who believe everybody in this house believes these signs should be following us it says in my name they will number one on the list cast out demons they will speak with new tongues so if we haven't been released in our prayer language, let's get her done. Let's pray. Let's get, that, let's get that gift in operation in you. But also, I want you to be open to two things. 
more freedom and healing in your own life from spiritual stuff. And I can teach, I can clarify, I can biblically clarify that yes, Christians can have these things in their life. But we also need to be ready to be engaged when, when these things show up, when we have the opportunity to pray. Even in our own family, you know. Sherry um, has a testimony of that, of praying in her own family. And, and, and she fasted up and it had a breaker anointing when she did pray. And so for such a time as this, we need to, we need to be able to operate in, in this ministry. And I'm not going to call it a gift. In a minute, I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to call it a gift. Um, do you realize that uh, there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit gifts, right? We have Father gifts in, First Corinth, or in, uh, in Romans chapter 12. We have the Son gifts in Romans 11, or Ephesians 11. And we have the Holy Spirit gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in all three of those sets of gifts, it never says that deliverance is a gift. You know Why? Because it's not a gift. It's a mandate. It's a call. It's a commission. It's something that Jesus told us all to do. And these signs shall follow. And, and, and the first thing is they shall do this. So it's not a gift. So if you're waiting for that to be your gift, you're going to keep waiting because it's not a gift. It's a mandate. It's, a, it's an anointing on all of us to do it. And, and some of you guys are thinking, it's just not for me. It's not for me. It will be for you when you see your grandson or granddaughter, you know, manifesting with tormenting dreams. It will be. It will be when you see somebody that you love ready to commit suicide. And if you don't take action and break that thing off, they may be dead if you don't take action. Amen? This is for us, every one of us. We cannot, we cannot sit around on this stuff. It is commissioned by the Lord. It's not a gift. Luke 10, 17, this is an old favorite. Um, it says that uh, then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Okay, they, there's joy in this, guys, and we don't want to do it for the joy. It's a byproduct of seeing people set free, of seeing people healthy and whole, and oh my gosh, it's the most rewarding thing in the whole world that you, just you, little old you and little old me, can be used by the God of the universe to, to minister the life of Jesus. And it's the greatest joy in the world. There's nothing greater. There's nothing better. And, and, and the Lord Lord, even he said they said Lord even the demons are subject to us in your name you know what they, they're subject to you as well in his name and verse 19 he says behold I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all say all all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's a promise from your Savior. And that's, that's he's commissioning the, the disciples to go out in Luke 10. We are his disciples, every one of us, amen? Okay, so the ministry of deliverance is, is a, the ministry of the New Testament evangelist, but it's also called, you know, we're called to it. Um, it's so needed in this hour, so much. I just want to talk for a few minutes. There's so much darkness right now. COVID virus. You know, if we're watching, you're watching on you, uh, the video right now. You, this may be 10 years from now. We're going through this virus called COVID, COVID-19. And it has put this whole world in a havoc. This whole world has come under. And I saw and I heard this statistic. I don't know how they would have come up with this number. But five times, five times more, five times more depression, five times more anxiety, five times more drug addiction, five times more suicide going on, five times more confusion. Remember, I taught on confusion. Whenever you hear confusion, look for mixing. Someplace you're mixing light and dark, truth and error. Mixing comes from confusion. There's so much confusion out there. People are confused. They've been locked up. They've been in, in lockdown. They've been in isolation. It's had an effect on people. And I got to tell you, this effect is not good. There's people that need deliverance just from this virus alone. They needed it probably going into this virus, but it's, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Pornography's off the chart sexual abuse is off the chart and I have one question where is the church in all of that where's the church ministering these people you know what they're doing they're sending them to the psychologist and the psychiatrist and they're putting them on medications they're sending them to counseling I gotta tell you if it's a demon you can't counsel out a demon you can't you can't you can't you can't you can you can help modify their behavior but they're gonna leave out of that counseling office with that same spirit on board so so God's calling us at this church to be the church that will minister life and freedom and healing to people and, and you'll see 
you'll see. He'll start sending us people. We get equipped, we get, we get under the understanding and we start doing it with excellence. God will send his kids here because he loves them. He wants to see them whole. Don't you want to see your kids whole? Well, he's a, he's a good father, God, and he wants his kids whole. So at any rate, Robert, he said three times, well, I'm going to skip, I'm going to come back to that. Robert said three times, they're coming they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Pastor Keith, they're coming, amen? And so I just want to, I want to go and talk about the church a little bit and how the church is out there. The church has been dropping the balls. And I want to just talk about this. Anybody who minimizes the need for deliverance, and oh, it's big out there. The more churches you go, you just go to the pastor. What's your view on deliverance? That should be a good, good question to every church you go to. Anybody who minimizes hell, we talked about that. There's churches real nearby that will never talk about it, and they'll actually teach away from it. Um, and the power of the devil, okay? And I understand. Let me just clarify. I want to clarify that, say, I, that I do not want to instill fear, and I don't want to instill an unhealthy attraction for hell at all where we're, we're thinking demon 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 but I got to tell you we need to be mindful of the spiritual realm we need to recognize that we are at war we are at war you know and I just want to talk I got a little bit of page of 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 notes here that I just want to talk about clarifying scriptures that say we are at war and then we got to take this stuff very very serious any church that doesn't take it serious I'm going to say this they are doing a great injustice to the body of Christ and you know what? There's big names. I could name pastors that you guys are all honoring and thinking they're the best, and they will say stuff like, the devil's just a toothless lion. The devil's been defeated. The devil's this. The devil's that. Well, I've got to tell you, that devil's doing some pretty big havoc on our nation, and he's doing it right in the church of the pastors that are saying that stuff because they're not discipling into their ability to take authority and dominion over this devil that we have. And if we're not aware of that, if we're not conscientiously understanding that, we're sitting ducks. We, we really are defenseless, and it's sad because... Families are getting took out. Marriages are getting took out. Mar uh, you know, health, people's health is getting took out. They don't even know that there's a such thing as a spirit of infirmity afflicting their physical body. We need to educate and, and move into freedom and healing in this house, and God will send the people. He'll send his kids here, I promise you. Paul said we're in a wrestling match, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I wrestled for four years in high school. It is one of the most intense sports out there. It is, the, for its time period, three two-minute periods, you are going full out or you're going to get pinned. And, and you're, you're going with every ounce of strength. You're using every muscle in your body. And Paul said, we're in a wrestling match. We are in a wrestling match with spiritual things, not flesh and blood, with spiritual things. Paul said that we're soldiers. Be good soldiers. You know, we've been enlisted in the army of God. We're soldiers. He, he doesn't minimize it. And, and, and so I, I, I wrote this. We want to put the B. Jesus put the B in balance. I started a sermon 20 years ago and never finished it. Jesus put the B in balance. He'll, he'll go over and minister deliverance over here and he'll come over and he'll, he'll love on this person with the agape, amazing, extravagant love of God. And, and he had it all. He was well balanced. He didn't get way over here and stay away over here and he didn't get over here and just go, love, love, love. You never, if you just love, the demons will leave you alone and they'll leave your kids alone. That's a lie. It's not true. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. He never wakes up and says, I think I'll be nice to Keith today. No, no, no. Every day, Every chance he gets, he will steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, so, so the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, the Bible says. The carnal, where we get the, the word carnal, carnal is meat. You know, we go to the carnival. There's a lot of carnality at the carnival. We get chili, carn carny. That means there's meat in that chili. We are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against spiritual, it's a spiritual battle. And, and our warfare, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We're not going to use a knife and a gun and an axe and a stick. We're going to use our mouth we're going to say no in jesus name the blood of jesus is against you you will not you will not i have just been i've been praying more warfare over our services in just the last couple and i'm seeing such a big difference it's like we don't get the distractions we don't get the resistance we don't get the opposition why because we're telling it no you guys can tell stuff no and it will respond because you have christ in you the hope of glory amen all right so underestimating our adversary is a huge mistake and his destructiveness. I don't want to put him up on a pedestal and say, oh, let's talk about the devil. I just want to say, let's talk about the devil. Let's talk about him in his defeated condition. And, and that's what so many churches do. They'll say, you know, Jesus is defeated. And, and excuse me, 
The devil's been defeated by Jesus, and Jesus has got the victory. That's true. But there's this word I want to introduce. It's called appropriate. Appropriate means you, you make application to it. Appropriate means that, uh, I've got it written down here somewhere, but appropriate means that, that you are uh, facilitating it. You are, you're making it happen. You're, you're, you're taking advantage of whatever that is to, to operate in. So if you don't appropriate it, here's what some guys, or here's what, um, for instance, Peter said. Peter said that he goes around in 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil goes around like a roaring, prowling lion seeking whom he may devour. Can he, have you ever watched the animal kingdom? Have you ever watched, you know, National Geographic and watched those, uh, those lions ripping a, a gazelle apart? It's not pretty. It's gruesome. They'll even say it's graphic. Don't let your kids watch this. That's what the devil is doing to people in the spiritual realm. Peter is trying to give you the clue, give me the clue, give us the clue. This is serious, guys. This is not fun and games. This is not, this is not, oh, if you'd like to do deliverance, this is an option for you. This is not optional. This is the devil that we are up against. Um, Paul said he's the ruler of darkness. He rules in the darkness. There's, we were talking about the, mid, or the, the fourth watch. The fourth watch is when more evil destruction and heinousness goes on. Why? Because he's the ruler of darkness. He's shredding people's lives in, that, in that, that dark, dark time. Okay, John said the whole world is under his sway. That's a lot. The whole world is under his sway. There's influence all over. When I went and I heard Paula preach, she was talking about the influences of the adversary and how clueless people are. He is all about getting influence. He's all about spheres of influence. And we are the only ones on the, pro on the planet that are authorized to take back his influence. We're the only ones because of Christ in us. We have been authorized to do the same thing Jesus was manifest to do, to destroy the works of the devil. And so... Jesus, and we have scriptures like, put on the full armor of God. We think, well, that's nifty. Let's get the full armor. You know what they're for? So that we can come against the wiles of the devil. All through scripture, it's talking about how we need to appropriate this, the, 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 the things that God has given us to overcome the enemy. It's, it's in there, guys, all through the Bible. In, in 1 John 14, 30, it says, the ruler of this world has come, and Jesus said, and he has nothing in me. That's actually First John talking about Jesus, but, but he has nothing in him. That's our goal, guys. We, we don't want any place for him in our lives. Get the buttons out, amen. Get those things off. And so, amen. So this is serious, guys. We are at war. We are in a battle, a spiritual battle. Colossians 2.15 says that Jesus disarmed the principalities and the powers, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. But again, it must be appropriated. What he accomplished, we need to appropriate into our life. Sherry and I were talking about this, coming to church this morning. She goes, well, well, you know, when you come to Christ, you know, doesn't this or that happen? And we talked about no two people are the same and no two situations are the same. Like you might be Steve here and he was in this great family where they loved the Lord and they prayed for him and he came to the Lord at a very young age and he never, he never had a lot of affliction and opposition in his life. And so he may come in different than somebody else that was tormented and abused and neglected and all so so everybody's different and even that person that was tormented and abused and neglected they may have just had some kind of an angel protecting them through the whole thing and they might be in better shape than the guy that came into the came into the kingdom on the in the spiritual household i gotta tell you there's no two people that are the same and no two situations that are the same and what i want you to come away with is everybody needs something they need has something they need to get rid of it could be just the way we 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 respond to something if we're reacting instead of responding with the love and the goodness of god and the peace and the joy there's something there we need it out we need it out in jesus name so i'm about done paul said in second corinthians 2 11 he said lest the devil take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices do you know that they weren't ignorant because Paul was discipling him. We need to, I'm just trying to disciple you guys into the kingdom of God concerning spiritual warfare. I'm trying to disciple you so that we're not ignorant. We're, we're ignorant if we're not learning. We're, 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 and you know what the worst part is? You know what the definition of dumb is? Is ignorant on purpose. Well, I don't even want to... <laughs> I don't even want to know about that. I don't, that doesn't concern me. That's dumb. That's, that'd be dumb right there to, to say, uh, this doesn't apply to me. I don't want to know about la, 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 la type deal. Okay, and then James 4, 7 says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. 
A lot of people would just want to jump to resist the devil and then, he's, and then he'll flee. The submitting himself and, and a lot of the rest of the church is just submitting themselves to God. They're like, I'm a Christian. I'm going to go to church because that's what you do. Okay, that's submitting themselves to God. But they don't, get, they don't get discipled on how to resist, how to resist. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is, is Brandon, my Brandon story. And, and this is a, just a, a, a quick testimony of resisting what, what it might look like. And I know I said this once before, but Brandon was in my youth group. At Brandon, Brandon preached before the church, I think at 12 years old. He, his dad bought him a real nice outfit and he got up there this this young man was excelling in the things of god he is right now over a bible um college type uh uh impartation ministry in um, Brazil and he's, he's discipling disciples and he's he's really on fire for the Lord and so here's here's Brandon and uh <clears throat> he's he's down there in, in Brazil and somebody comes to him and says Brandon, the Lord showed me last night that there's going to be an assignment against your marriage. And Brandon looked at her and he said, did you break it off? And the person was quiet. And he said, did you break it off? And she was still quiet. And he said, did you break it off? And she said, no. And he said, he said, Let's pray right now. Here's the point. And that was intense, I know. But you know what? You guys are getting stuff in the spiritual realm. You guys are seeing stuff in the spiritual realm. God has given you things, to, and, and we need to break them off. All you have to do is say, I break that off in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus against you, devil. No, you won't. No, you won't. There's so much power. It says that the righteous deliver themselves by, the, by their mouth, and it says in Proverbs. So it's so important that we step into this, guys, with both feet, that we start to, to recognize we are in a battle. We are in a war, and we got to be the army of God. Amen? And so we got communion today. We got communion, and, and um, here's how we're going to do communion. I want to seal up what we learned about the New Testament evangelists, but I want to also seal up and, and pray into the prophetic. There was something Paula said, but I also want to honor little David. Little David is, is back in the... Uh, He's back in there, but little David was laid out, and then he did it again today, and, and it was, he were, uh, Doug and, and Julie were getting ministered to because he grabbed the black flag, and what is the black flag? Righteous judgment, and the Lord was speaking. So I believe that there's, a, there's righteous judgment in this hour that the Lord is doing, but he's looking to raise up his church, his army, his last day's saints and army to minister life and healing, and, and so I just want to honor David. Um, as we prepare to take communion we're going to open up and you guys actually can start coming up and getting your elements but i just want to honor you david and and i'm so proud of you i'm so proud of you and and so you know what, what I, i'm so proud of you for because you've got a man you got a heart right in here you got a heart after god's own heart and that's what they said about king david king david had a heart after god's own heart because you will humble yourself and it's so important you'll humble yourself and get down and pray and you don't care what anybody thinks you're all about jesus you're all about just drawing near to him and so i am so thankful and i'm so proud of you and father we just pray the same heart that david has that we'd have that same heart that we'd have that childlike heart in us and that we would be quick to humble ourselves in jesus name love you David I'm proud of you I'm proud of you thank you Lord thank you Lord so why don't we start to come up and let's all take this partake of communion and I'll just keep talking while we do thank you Jesus thank you Lord so one of the things that Paula and Robert talked about is the prophetic in this house okay and he said Paul uh, Robert saw it and he said there is a lot of prophetic there's a lot of prophets in this house oh my my there's there's prophetic in this house there's prophetic in this house and then he said but a lot of you are stuck okay I wrote down word for word what he said and you guys can get that off of Facebook and and listen to what he might have spoke over you but I encourage you to read and listen to those again and uh, he said uh, he said you guys can hear from God you guys can hear from God, but you can't get out of yourselves. Now, I don't know. Make application, however that might apply to you. Um, he said you have, it's like there's an inward fear and a hesitating spirit. And then he talked about the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And so with that, I just want to 
I just want to believe that as we're preparing to take communion today, we're, we're not only going to uh, engage the New Testament evangelist that's on uh, that call that's on every one of our lives, but I also want to pray over the prophetic in this house. And uh, I'm glad you guys are up here. We've got, we've got a, a Doug who, who identifies as an evangelist. We have... Uh, uh, Come on up here. We, we, we need you guys up here because this is a prophet evangelist team. And, and I just want, I want to honor the gifts that are in the house today as we take communion. But uh, also, um, you know, I was actually going to have Sherry pray over the prophetic as, as we take communion as well, that there's going to be an impartation. You know, communion's awesome, and it's, it's got multiple benefits. But today, I want to believe that there's going to be an impartation as we take communion together today. Amen? And so, Brian and, Brian and Karen Langton, we honor you. We honor the prophet in, in Karen. We honor the, the evangelist in Brian. And, and Doug, we have honor the evangelist in you. And Sherry, I honor my, my wife today. She has a prophetic gift, and I got to tell you, sometimes it's not all that much fun to live with a prophet because they know everything. They see everything. Oh my gosh, you can't get away with anything. But I got to tell you, God wants to honor the gifts of God in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, um, first off, let's see, how, how should we do this, Holy Spirit? Thank you, Lord. First off, we're just going to pray. We're just going to pray. Father God, I just want to honor the gifts of God, and I want to honor Robert and Paula and what they deposited in this house. And Lord, we don't want that to slip by. We don't, want any, we don't want any of that to go by the wayside. We grab on to what was available last week. Whether you are here or not, that's still available for you today. If you want it, it's available for you today. And Lord, we also pray into the evangelistic anointing that, that you want for everybody in this house and every one of our kids and every one of us to see ourselves different. That we are New Testament evangelists. We are called to go out, seek and save the lost, release the life of Jesus, minister healing and freedom, pray for them to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and get them water baptized. All of those are elements of the New Testament of evangelists, and every one of us is called to do every one of those things. And so I bless the gift of the New Testament evangelist and the anointing in that heart that would be on our hearts, Lord, that we'd have a heart just like little David, a heart after God's own heart to want to see souls saved and healed in Jesus' name. And Sherry, go ahead and just pray over the prophets in in the house amen okay thank you lord for every prophet in this house please forgive us lord for the ways in which maybe we haven't used the gifting that you've given us to impart to one another mm -hmm. when we get a word that we speak it we declare it we decree it to be a thing lord we thank you for um knowing in and the ways that you've shown us holy spirit come come right now lord thank you lord rain down on us Give us something. Give us something, Lord. Mm, Anything. You, Lord. Anything. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But Father, we're just going to believe that this is going to be a time of impartation. As we take this element right now, it, it, is, it is, is, is in symbolic representation of your body, which was broken for us. If there's any sickness in this house, if there's anything that's not of God, we pray, we pray for manifested healing in this house. As we partake of this element, Lord, we're, take, we're partaking of you. You said, if you won't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. That's sounds kind of gnarly but but what we're doing lord is we are engaging in your body and your blood and we're saying yes and amen to everything you have for us we are appropriating the victory of the cross of calvary we're appropriating everything that you died and did for us through the resurrection and everything that you've given us through the gifting and the power of god so as we partake of this just take of it with a, a just an anticipation to receive an impartation in jesus name thank you lord Thank you, Lord. We receive it, Lord, by faith. By faith, we receive. We're going to walk out that door different in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of, the, the, of my blood in the, in the, test, in the New Testament, and, and, and the New Testament covenant in my blood. And so we just lift up this cup right now, and we thank you that the blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We thank you that the blood 
is a weapon of mass destruction. It's a weapon of warfare. We appropriate the blood. We put it over the lintels and the doorposts of our life and over our household and over our families and over our kids. We appropriate the blood and the, and the victory that it yes. established on the cross of Calvary. And from this day forward, Lord, we are going to operate by speaking that blood over circumstances and situations. We're going to break off the works of the enemy. We're going to declare by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony that no weapon formed against us is going to prosper and we're going to set the captives free we're going to go in like Jude says and snatch the sinner from the fire from this day forward I declare every person in here is going to operate in a new authority and a new power according to your testament and your blood as we partake of this we receive it Jesus in your name amen Amen. hallelujah hallelujah and the the word of God says as often as you drink this cup and and uh, eat this Eat this bread and drink this cup. You do it in, in remembrance of me. Amen? We got a song, and I got to tell you about the song. Okay, I have played this song over and over and over, sometimes seven, eight, nine times a day. It's just been ministering to my, my soul. You all know it. You all know this song. And I was mechanic in the other day, and, and I, I, I was like, Lord, I got to do some overhead welding. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to burn through this, this tank. And so I put the song on, and I waited till the second verse where it was really gets going. And I, I made such a great weld. It was like, man, it was like an anointed weld. And then, and then last week I had this like nasty job I had to go steam clean I knew it was going to blow back in my face and I thought I'm putting in that song again so I put that song in I had the best time steam cleaning and then I had this project where I forgot to put an o-ring on the back of this thing and I got it all together it took me an hour to get it all together and I, I greased it and the grease came out in the wrong spot and I thought dang it Lord I, I did it wrong and I thought I'll put the song in. I put that song on this song on and I did an hour project in the time that this song is probably five minutes it was like he translated me through the project listening to this song he supernatural gave me everything I needed to do the whole project a second time and I did it in the time of this song I just want to tell you this song blesses me I hope it blesses you as much as it blesses me but let's just worship the Lord on this last song amen God bless you